Hello, my darling. How are you today? I hope that you are good. And I hope that you are able to relax. Today we start The Lost World, Chapter 4. It's just the very biggest thing in the world. Hardly was it shut when Mrs. Challenger darted from the dining room. The small woman was in a furious temper. She barred her husband's way like an enraged chicken in front of a bulldog. It was evident that she had seen my exit but had not observed my return. You brute, George, she screamed. You've hurt that nice young man. George jerked backwards with his thumb. Here he is, safe and sound behind me. She was confused, but not unduly so. I am so sorry, dear, I didn't see you. I assure you, madam, that it is all right, I responded. He has marked your poor face. Oh, George, what a brute you are. Nothing but scandals from one end of the week to the other. Everyone hating and making fun of you. You've finished my patience. This ends it. Dirty linen, he rumbled. It's not a secret, she cried. Do you suppose that the whole street, the whole of London for that matter, get away, Austin, we don't want you here. Do you suppose they don't talk about you? Where is your dignity? You, a man. You. You should have been tenured at a great university with a thousand students all revering you. Where is your dignity, George? How about yours, my dear? He responded. You try me too much, George. A ruffian. A common brawling ruffian. That's what you have become now. Be good now, Jessie, he responded. You are a roaring, raging bully, she cried. That's done it. Stool of penance, said he. To my amazement, he stooped, picked her up, and placed her sitting upon a high pedestal of black marble in the angle of the hall. It was at least seven feet high and so thin that she could hardly balance upon it. A more absurd object than she presented, cocked up there with her face convulsed with anger, her feet dangling, her body rigid for fear of an upset. I could not imagine. Let me down, George, she wailed. You have to say please, he responded. You brute, George. Let me down this instant. He shook his head, and he looked at me. Come into the study, Mr. Malone. But really, sir, I said, looking at the lady. Here's Mr. Malone pleading for you, Jessie. Say please, and down you come. Oh, you brute, please. Fine, I said please. He took her down as if she had been a canary. You must behave yourself, dear, he said. Mr. Malone is a pressman. He will have it all in his rag tomorrow and sell a dozen extra among our neighbors. The title will be Strange Story of High Life. You felt fairly high on that pedestal, didn't you not? Then a subtitle. Glimpse of a singular menage. He's a foul feeder, is Mr. Malone, a carrion eater like all of his kind, a swine from the devil's herd. That's it, Malone. What? I was upset, of course. You are really intolerable, I said hotly. He bellowed with laughter. We shall have a coalition presently, he boomed, looking from his wife to me and puffing out his enormous chest. Then, upon altering his tone, Excuse this frivolous family badinage, Mr. Malone. I called you back for some serious purpose than to mix you up with our little domestic pleasantries. 
Run away, little woman, and don't fret now. He placed a huge hand upon each of her shoulders. All that you say is perfectly true. I would, of course, be a better man if I did what you advise. But then I wouldn't be George Edward Challenger, now would I? There are plenty of better men, my dear, but only one, George, Edward, Challenger. So make the best of him. He gave her a resounding kiss, which embarrassed me even more than his violence had done. Now, Mr. Malone, he said, with a great accession of dignity, this way, if you please. We re-entered the room, which we had left so tumultuously, Ten minutes before, the professor closed the door carefully behind us and motioned me into an armchair, and he pushed a cigar box under my nose. Real San Juan, Colorado, he said. Excited people like you are better for narcotics. Oh, heavens now, don't bite it. Cut, and you cut it with reverence. Now lean back and listen attentively to whatever I may care to say to you. If any remark should occur to you, you can reserve it for some more opportune time. First of all, as to your return to my house after your most justifiable expulsion, he protruded his beard at this, and he stared at me as one who challenges and invites contradiction after, as I say, your well-merited expulsion. The reason lay in your answer to that most officious policeman. In this, I seem to discern some glimmering of good feeling upon your part, more at any rate, than I am accustomed to associate with your profession. In admitting that the fault of the incident lay with you, you gave some evidence of a certain mental detachment and breath of view, which attracted my favorable notice. The subspecies of the human race to which you unfortunately belong has always been below my mental horizon. Your words brought you suddenly above this. You swam up into my serious notice. For this reason, I asked you to return with me, as I was minded to make your further acquaintance. You will kindly deposit your ash in the small Japanese tray on the bamboo table, which you can find near your left elbow. All of this he boomed forth like a professor addressing his class. He had swung around his revolving chair so as to face me, and he sat, all puffed out like an enormous bullfrog, his head laid back, his eyes half covered by supercilious lids. Now he suddenly turned himself sideways, and all I could see of him was tangled hair and a red, protruding ear. He was scratching about among the litter of papers upon his desk. He faced me presently with what looked like a very tattered sketchbook in his hand. I'm going to talk to you about South America, he said. No comments, if you please. First of all, I wish you to understand that nothing I tell you now is to be repeated in any public way, unless you have my express permission. That permission will, in all human probability, never be given. Is this clear? That is very hard, I said. Surely a judicious account. He placed the notebook upon the table. This ends it, he said. I wish you a very good morning, sir. No, no, I cried. I submit to any conditions. As far as I can see, I have no choice. None in the world, said he. Well then, I promise. Your word of honor, he asked. My word of honor, I replied. He looked at me with doubt in his insolent eyes. After all, what do I know about your honor? He asked. Upon my word, sir, I cried. 
you take very great liberties. I have never been so insulted in my life. He seemed more interested than annoyed at my outbreak. Round-headed, he muttered, brachiophallic, gray-eyed, black-haired. Are you Celtic, I presume? I am an Irishman, sir. Ah, oh, are you Irish, Irish? Yes, sir. That, of course, explains it, he said. Let me see. You have given me your promise that my confidence will be respected. That confidence, I may say, will be far from complete. But I am prepared to give you a few indications which will be of interest. In the first place, you are probably aware that two years ago I made a journey to South America, one which will be classical in the scientific history of the world. The object of my journey was to verify some conclusions of Wallace and of Bates, which could only be done by observing their reported facts, and it needed to be under the same conditions in which they had themselves noted. If my expedition had no other results, it would still have been noteworthy. But a curious incident occurred to me, and this opened up an entirely fresh line of inquiry. You are aware, or probably in this half-educated age you are not aware, that the country round some parts of the Amazon is still only partially explored. There are a great number of tributaries, some of them entirely uncharted, which run into the main river. It was my first business to visit this little-known back country and to examine its fauna. This furnished me with the materials for several chapters for that great and monumental work upon zoology, which will be my life's justification. I was returning, my work accomplished, when I had occasion to spend a night at a small Indian village, at a point where a certain tributary, the name and position of which I withhold, opens into the main river. The natives were Kukama Indians, an amiable but degraded race, have mental powers, though they are hardly superior to the average Londoner. I had effected some cures among them upon my way up the river, and had impressed them considerably with my personality. I was not surprised to find myself eagerly awaited upon my return. I gathered from their signs that someone had urgent need of my medical services, and I followed the chief to one of his huts. When I entered, I found that the sufferer to whose aid I had been summoned, had that instant expired. He was, to my surprise, not Indian, but a white man. Indeed, I might say a very white man, for he was flaxen-haired and had some characteristics of an albino. He was clad in rags, was very emaciated, and he bore every trace of prolonged hardship. So far as I could understand the account of the natives, he was a complete stranger to them, and had come upon their village through the woods alone, and in the last stage of exhaustion. The man's knapsack lay beside the couch, and I examined the contents. His name was written upon a tab within it, Maple White, Lake Avenue, Detroit, Michigan. It is a name to which I am prepared always to lift my hat. It is not too much to say that it will rank level with my own when the final credit of this business comes to be apportioned. From the contents of the knapsack, it was evident that this man had been an artist and poet in search of effects. There were scraps of verse, 
I do not profess to be a judge of such things, but they appeared to me to be singularly wanting in merit. There were also some rather commonplace pictures of river scenery, a paint box, a box of colored chalks, some brushes, a curved bone, which now lies upon my inkstand, a volume of Baxter's moths and butterflies, a cheap revolver, and a few cartridges. Of personal equipment, he had either none, or he had lost it in his journey. Such were the total effects of this strange American bohemian. I was turning away from his body when I observed that something projected from the front of his ragged jacket. It was a sketchbook, which was as dilapidated then as you see it now. Indeed, I can assure you that a first folio of Shakespeare could not be treated with greater reverence than this relic. In my possession, it has been nothing but well treated. I hand it to you now, and I ask you to take it page by page to examine the contents. Challenger helped himself to a cigar, and he leaned back with fiercely critical eyes, taking note of the effect which this document would produce. I had opened the volume with some expectation of a revelation, though of what nature I could not imagine. The first page was disappointing, however, as it contained nothing but the picture of a very fat man in a pea jacket. On the legend it read, Jimmy Culver, on the mail boat. There followed several pages which were filled with small sketches of Indians and their ways. Then came a picture of a cheerful and corpulent ecclesiastic in a shovel hat. He was sitting opposite a very thin European, alongside the inscription, Lunch with Fra Cristofero at Rosario. Studies of women and babies accounted for several more pages, and then there was an unbroken series of animal drawings with such explanations as manatee upon sandbank, turtles and their eggs, black ajuti under a miriti palm, the matter disclosing some of the pig-like animal, and finally came a double page of studies of long-snouted and very unpleasant-looking creatures. Saurians, perhaps. I could make nothing of it, though, and said so to the professor. Surely these are only crocodiles, I asked. They are alligators, obviously. There is hardly such a thing as a true crocodile in South America. The distinction between them... I cut him off. I meant that I could see nothing unusual. Nothing to justify what you have just said to me. Challenger smiled at me serenely. Try the next page. I was still unable to be as excited. It was a full-page sketch of a landscape roughly tinted in color, the kind of painting which an open-air artist takes as a guide to a future and more elaborate effort. There was a pale green foreground of feathery vegetation which sloped upwards and ended in a line of cliffs dark red in color. There were curiously ribbed-like balsatic formations which I think I have seen before. They extended in an unbroken wall right across the background. At one point was an isolated, pyramid-shaped rock crowned by a great tree. This appeared to be separated by a cleft from the main crag. Behind it all, a blue tropical sky. A thin green line of vegetation which frimmed the summit of the rudy cliff. Well, Challenger asked, it is no doubt a curious formation, I said. 
but I am not geologist enough to say that this is wonderful or exciting. He laughed at me, wonderful, exciting. This is unique, Ned. This is incredible. No one on earth has ever dreamed of such a possibility. Now on to the next page. I turned it over and gave an exclamation of surprise. There was a full page picture of the most extraordinary creature I had ever seen. It was the wild dream of an opium smoker, a vision of delirium. The head was like that of a fowl, the body that of a bloated lizard. The trailing tail was furnished with upward turned spikes. The creature had a curved back, edged with high serrated fringe. This looked like a dozen cock swaddles placed behind each other. In front of this creature was an absurd mannequin, or dwarf, in human form, which seemed to be staring at it. Well, what do you think, Malone? cried the professor. He rubbed his hands with an air of triumph. It is monstrous. It is grotesque, I said. But what would make him draw such an animal? I looked at him thoughtfully. Trey Chin, obviously. He looked at me with crazy eyes. Oh, that's the best explanation you can give it, eh? Well, sir, I was exasperated. What is yours? The obvious explanation, Malone, is that this creature exists. It was actually sketched from life. I should have laughed at this, only that I had a vision of our doing another Catherine wheel down the passage. No doubt, said I, no doubt indeed, as one humors an imbecile. I confess, however, I added, that this tiny human figure puzzles me. If he were an Indian, we could set it down as evidence of some pygmy race in America but it appears to be drawn with a European sun hat. Challenger snorted like an angry buffalo. You really touched the limit, Malone, he said. You enlarge my view of the possible. Cerebral, paresis, mental inertia, wonderful. He was acting too absurd to make me angry. Instead, it was a waste of energy. For if you were going to be angry with this man, you would be angry all the time. I contented myself with smiling wearily at him. It struck me that the man was small, is all I meant, said I. Look here, Malone, Challenger cried. He leaned forward and dabbed a great hairy sausage of a finger on the pitcher. You see the plant behind the animal. I suppose you thought it was a dandelion or a Brussels sprout. Well, this is a vegetable ivory palm, and they run about fifty or sixty feet high. Don't you see that the man put this in for a purpose? He couldn't really have stood in front of that brute and lived to draw it. He sketched himself in to give a scale of heights. He was, we will say, about five feet high. The tree is ten times bigger, which is what one would expect. Good heavens, I cried. Then you think the brute was? Why, Charing Cross Station would have made a kennel for such a beast. Apart from your exaggeration, the professor responded. He is certainly a well-grown specimen. I responded, now wait just a minute. Surely the whole experience of the human race is not to be set aside on account of a single sketch. I had turned over the leaves at this point and ascertained that there was nothing more in the book. A single sketch challenger by a wandering American artist who may have done it while under hashish or in the delirium of fever or simply in order to gratify a freakish imagination. You cannot, as a man of science, defend such a position as this. 
In answer, Challenger took a book down from his shelf. This is an excellent monograph by my gifted friend, Ray Lancaster, he said. There is an illustration here which would interest you. Ah, oh, yes, here it is. The inscription beneath reads, Probable appearance in life of the Jurassic dinosaur Stegosaurus. The hind leg alone is twice as tall as a fully grown man. Well, what do you make of this, Ned? He handed me the open book. I stared as I looked at the picture. In this reconstructed animal of a dead world, there was certainly a great resemblance to the sketch of the unknown artist. This is certainly remarkable, I replied. But you won't admit that it is final, Challenger asked. Surely it might be a coincidence, sure. Or this American may have seen a picture of this kind and carried it with him in his memory. This would be likely to recur to a man in delirium. Very good, said the professor indulgently. We leave it at that. I will now ask you to look at this bone. He handed me a bone, which he had already described as part of the dead man's possessions. It was about six inches long and thicker than my thumb. And there were some indications of dried cartilage at one end of it. Tell me, Malone, said the professor. To what known creature does this bone belong? I examined the bone with care and tried to recall some half-forgotten knowledge. I guess it could be a very thick human collarbone, I said. My companion waved his hand in contemptuous depreciation. The human collarbone is curved, Malone. This is straight. There is a groove upon its surface which shows us that a great tendon played across it. This would not be the case with a clavicle. I looked at him carefully. Then I must confess that I don't know what this is. My dear boy, he replied, you need not be ashamed to expose your ignorance. I don't suppose the whole South Kensington staff could even give me a name for this. He took a little bone the size of a bean out of a pill box. So far as I am judge, this human bone is the analog of the one which you hold in your hand. This will give you some of the size of this creature. You will observe from the cartilage that this is no fossil specimen, but recent. What do you say to this? I replied, it must be an elephant then. Challenger winced, as if in pain. Don't talk of elephants in South America, even in these days of boarding schools. Well, I interrupted, any large South American animal, maybe a taper, for example. Challenger replied, You may take it, young man, that I am versed in the elements of my business. This is not a conceivable bone either of a taper or any other creature known to zoology. It belongs to a very large, very strong, and by all analogy, a very fierce animal. It exists upon the face of the earth, but has not yet come under the notice of science. Are you still unconvinced? I shook my head. I am at least deeply interested, I promise, he replied. Then your case is not hopeless. I feel that there is a reason lurking in you somewhere, so we will patiently grope around for it. We will now leave the dead American and proceed on with my narrative. You can imagine that I could hardly come away from the Amazon without probing deeper into this matter, of course. There were indications as to the direction from which the dead traveler had come. Indian legends would alone have been my guide, for I found that rumors of a strange land were common 
among all the riverine tribes. You have heard, no doubt, of Kuupuri. I shook my head. No, I never have. He responded, The Kuupuri is the spirit of the woods. Something terrible. Something malevolent. Something to be avoided. None can describe its shape or nature. But it is a word of terror among the Amazon. Now all the tribes agree as to the direction in which the Kuruperi lives. It was the same direction from which the American had come. Something terrible lay that way. It was my business to find out what it was. What did you do? My flippancy was all gone. This massive man compelled one's attention and respect. Challenger responded. I overcame the extreme reluctance of the natives, a reluctance which extends even to talk upon the subject, and by a judicious persuasion of gifts, aided, I will admit, by some threats of coercion. I got two of them to act as my guides, after many adventures which I need not describe, and after traveling a distance which I will not mention in a direction which I will withhold. We came at last to a tract of country which has never been described, nor indeed visited, save by my unfortunate predecessor. Would you kindly look at this? Challenger handed me a photograph, half plate size, he explained. The unsatisfactory appearance of this is due to the fact that on descending the river, the boat was upset, and the case which contained the underdeveloped film was broken. This had disastrous results. Nearly all of them were totally ruined, an irreparable loss. This is one of the few which partially escaped. This explanation of deficiencies or abnormalities you will kindly accept. There was talk of faking. I am not in a mood to argue such a point. I looked at the photograph more closely. It was certainly very off-colored. Any unkind critic might easily have misinterpreted that dim surface. It was a dull, gray landscape, and as I gradually deciphered the details of it, I realized that it represented a long, an enormously high line of cliffs, exactly like an immense cataract seen in the distance. There were long, sloping, tree-clad plains in the foreground. I believe this is the same place as the painted picture, I said. The professor answered, yes, this is the same place. I found traces of the fellow's camp, now look at this. It was a nearer view of the same scene, though the photograph was extremely defective. I could distinctly see the isolated, tree-crowned pinnacle of rock which was detached from the crag. I have no doubt at all, I said. Well, that is something gained, he replied. We progress, do we not? Now, Will you please look at the top of that rocky pinnacle? Do you observe anything there? An enormous tree, I answered. But what is on the tree? A large bird, I said. Challenger handed me a lens. Yes, I said, peering through the lens. I see a large bird standing on the tree. It appears to have a considerable beak. I would say this is a pelican. I cannot congratulate you upon your eyesight, said the professor. This is not a pelican, nor indeed is it a bird. It may interest you to know that I succeeded in shooting this particular specimen. It was the only absolute proof of my experiences which I was able to bring away with me. You have it then. Here at last was tangible corroboration. Well, I had it, 
he replied. It was unfortunately lost with so much else in the same boat accident, which ruined my photographs. I clutched at them as it disappeared in the swirl of the rapids, and part of its wing was left in my hand. I was insensible when I washed ashore, but the miserable remnant of my superb specimen was still intact. I lay it before you now. From a drawer, Challenger produced what seemed to be the upper portion of the wing of a large bat. It was at least two feet in length, a curved bone with a membranous veil beneath it. So it's a monstrous bat, I replied. Nothing of the sort, said the professor severely. Living as I do, in an educated and scientific atmosphere, I could not have conceived that the first principle of zoology were so little known. It is possible that you do not know the elementary fact in comparative anatomy. The wing of the bird is really the forearm, while the wing of a bat consists of three elongated fingers with membranes in between. Now in this case, the bone is certainly not the forearm, as you can see for yourself. This is a single membrane hanging upon a single bone. Therefore, this cannot belong to a bat. But if it is neither bat nor bird, what is it? My small stock of knowledge was exhausted. I really do not know, I said. Challenger opened the standard work to which he had already referred me. Here, he said, pointing to the picture of an extraordinary flying monster. This is an excellent reproduction of a pterodactyl, a flying reptile of the Jurassic period. On the next page is a diagram of the mechanism of its wing. Kindly compare this with the specimen in your hand. A wave of amazement passed over me as I looked. I was convinced. There could be getting no away with it. The cumulative proof was overwhelming. The sketch, the photographs, the narrative, and now an actual specimen. The evidence was complete. I said this. I said so warmly, for I felt that the professor was an ill-used man. He leaned back in his chair with drooping eyelids and a tolerant smile. He basked in this sudden gleam of sunshine. It's just the very biggest thing that I have ever heard of, I said, though it was my journalistic rather than my scientific enthusiasm that was roused. It is colossal. You are a Columbus of science who has discovered a lost world. I am awfully sorry if I seem to doubt you. It was all so unthinkable. But I understand evidence when I see it. And this should be good enough for anyone. The professor purred with satisfaction. And then, sir, what did you do next? It was the wet season, Mr. Malone, he replied, and my stores were exhausted. I explored some portion of this huge cliff, but I was unable to find a way to scale it. The pyramid-shaped rocks upon which I saw and shot the pterodactyl was more accessible. Being something of a crags man, I did manage to get halfway to the top of that, from the height, I had a better idea of the plateau upon the top of the crags. It appeared to be very large. Neither to east nor west could I see any end to the vista of green-capped cliffs. Below, it is a swampy, jungly region, full of snakes, insects, and fever. It is a natural protection to the singular country. Were there any other traces of life? I asked. No, sir. I saw none. 
But during the week that we lay and camped at the base of the cliff, we heard some very strange noises from above. But the creature the American drew, how do you account for that? We can only suppose that he must have made his way up to the summit and saw it there. We know, therefore, that there is a way up to the top. We also know that it must be a very difficult one. Otherwise, the creatures would have come down and overrun the surrounding country. Surely that is clear. But how did they come to be there, then? I asked. He replied, I do not think the problem is a very obscure one. There can be only one explanation. South America is, as you may have heard, a granite continent. At this single point in the interior, there has been, in some far distant age, a great, sudden, volcanic upheaval. These cliffs, I may remark, are balsatic and therefore plutonic, an area as large perhaps as Sussex, has been lifted up with all of its living contents and cut off by perpendicular precipices of a hardness which defies erosion from all of the rest of the continent. The result is that the ordinary laws of nature are suspended. The various checks which influence the struggle for existence in the world at large, or neutralized or altered. Creatures survive which would otherwise disappear. You will observe that both the pterodactyl and the stegosaurus are Jurassic, and therefore of a great age in the order of life. They have been artificially conserved by those strange, accidental conditions. I asked him, but surely your evidence is conclusive. You have only to lay it before the proper authorities, Challenger responded bitterly. It is simple, as I had imagined. I can only tell you that it was not so, that I was met at every turn by incredulity, born partly of stupidity, partly of jealousy. It is not in my nature, sir, to cringe to any man nor to seek to prove a fact if my world has been doubted. After the first, I have not condescended to show such corroborative proofs as I possess. The subject has become hateful to me. I would not speak of it. When men like yourself, who represent the foolish curiosity of the public, came to disturb my privacy, I was unable to meet them with any dignified reserve. By nature, I am, I must admit, somewhat fiery, and under provocation I am inclined to be violent. I fear you may have remarked that. I nursed my eye and was silent. Challenger continued. My wife tells me this all of the time, and yet I fancy that any man of honor would feel the same. Tonight, however, I propose to give an extreme example of the control of the will over the emotions. I will invite you to be present at the exhibition. He handed me a card from his desk. He continued, You will perceive that Mr. Percival Waldron, a naturalist of some popular repute, is announced to lecture at 8.30 at the Zoological Institute's Hall upon the record of the ages. I have been specially invited to present upon the platform and to move a vote of thanks to the lecturer. While doing so, I shall make it my business, with infinite tact and delicacy, to throw out a few remarks that may arouse the interest of the audience and maybe cause some of them to desire to go more deeply into the matter. Nothing contentious, you understand, but only an indication that there are greater deeps beyond. I shall hold myself strongly in leash and see whether this self-restraint I attain is a more favorable result. May I come? 
I asked eagerly. Well, surely, he answered. He had an enormously massive, genial manner, which was almost as overpowering as his violence. His smile of benevolence was a wonderful thing when his cheeks would suddenly bunch into two red apples between his half-closed eyes and his great black beard. By all means, do come. It will be a comfort to me to know that I have an ally in the hall, however inefficient and ignorant of the subject you may be. I fancy there will be a large audience for Waldron, though an absolute charlatan he does have a considerable popular following. Now, Mr. Malone, I have given you rather more of my time than I had intended. The individual must not monopolize what is meant for the world. I shall be pleased to see you at the lecture tomorrow. In the meantime, you will understand that no public use is to be made of any of the material I have given you. I hesitated. But my editor, he will want to know what I have done. Challenger replied, Tell him whatever you like. You can say, among other things, that if he sends anyone else to intrude upon me, I shall call upon him with a writing whip. But I leave it to you that nothing of this appears in print. Very good now. I will see you tonight. I had a last impression of red cheeks, a blue rippling beard, and intolerant eyes as he waved me out of the room. And this, my darling, ends chapter four of The Lost World. I hope that you are able to rest and sleep peacefully. Have very sweet dreams and creepy dreams. Good night.